This is Stuff You Like, and as much as I love Portal 2, I'm not really that up on my Greek mythology. So I brought in some help. I hear when you're not reviewing musicals, you're pretty hot on Tartarus? No, I said I was hot in Tartarus. But I knew my way around the Olympian pantheon before Percy Jackson made it cool. Also, apparently I'm fated to be dealing with portal-related media at this particular point in time. Ladies and gentlemen, diva, diva, everyone. Greetings, mortals! Let's do this. Portal was a big success, and with that came the clamoring for a sequel, but how to follow up this weird, short, puzzle-based FPS, but not Greek mythology, and a hero's journey, and Prometheus in a potato. Seriously, you can play Portal very comfortably in less than a day, and while its storytelling is excellent, it's brief. It asks more questions than it answers, and it implies more than it says, and it leaves you wanting more. Portal 2 also asks more questions than it answers, but it decided that everyone's favourite villain, and yes, we talked about this in a previous episode, needs a tragic backstory. So, the plot of Portal 2 Go with thusly. You, Chell, wake up from your stay in the Aperture Relaxation Vault after everything has gone a bit wrong. You meet Wheatley, a personality core who is terrible at everything, including keeping people alive, it seems. You and Wheatley travel through the ruins of the Aperture Science Laboratories trying to find a way out, and instead accidentally manage to reawaken GLaDOS. Nice job breaking it, hero. You are immediately thrown back into testing. You swap Wheatley into the computer instead of GLaDOS. Predictably, Wheatley immediately goes mad and throws you and GLaDOS, who is now in a potato battery, down into the bowels of Old Aperture, through which you must journey to get back up and defeat Wheatley, and yeah, you won, and now you're in a wheat field? Okay. And GLaDOS has a tragic backstory, and you guys kind of bond. I love it. So what does this have to do with mythology? Well, there are a bunch of hints as to the direction you should be looking, including a portrait in Old Aperture of Cave and Carolyn, and is that Aeschylus? As in the writer of Prometheus Bound, Aeschylus? Well, it may have been written by his son, so possible writer. Yeah, him. Well, could be, because it turns out the non-human characters seem to be very much modeled on some of the Titans. There are a lot of Titans in Greek mythology, but in this case I'm specifically referring to Prometheus, Epimetheus, Menetius, and Atlas. Quick Mythology 101 recap. The Titans were the children of Gaia the Earth and Uranus the Sky, who overthrew Uranus and were, in turn, overthrown by Zeus and his posse, who were the children of head Titans Kronos and Rhea, overthrowing parents being something of a family tradition among Greek deities. GLaDOS is Prometheus, Wheatley is Epimetheus, Atlas is, shockingly, Atlas, and Peabody is Menetius. Atlas and Peabody, for the uninitiated, are robots that you can play in the cooperative testing chambers. The Menetius connection to Peabody is the most tenuous, but it's in here for completeness. It seems logical because he's the fourth character and kind of the odd brother out. Also because he hangs around with Atlas and in mythology they're kind of a team until Zeus gets mad about that whole war thing. You don't hear much about Menetius, mostly because his main claim to fame is getting incinerated by Zeus's lightning bolt during the Titanomachy, the aforementioned overthrowing of the Titans by the Olympians. The name Menetius means doomed might, and he's usually represented as an embodiment of hubris, which is responsible for approximately 40% of the bad things that happen in Greek mythology, the other 60% being various gods getting pissed off at and or horny for some mortal or another, and it's also basically Aperture Science's corporate culture. Atlas is self-evidently named after the titan who holds up the sky, and that's a celestial sphere and not a globe. Right. That's correct. Atlas was the strongest of the Titans, which is why he was forced into this position instead of being cast into Tartarus with the rest of his family. He was also not very bright. In his penultimate labor, Heracles needed Atlas's help to pick some golden apples, its mythology just run with it, and so temporarily relieved the Titan of his burden. Atlas, naturally, sees this as an opportunity to make good his escape, but Heracles, who, it must be noted, was not exactly known for his mental prowess either, just goes, well, shoot, you got me, guess I gotta hold up the sky now. But would you mind taking it off my hands for just a second so I can pad my shoulders? Atlas falls for it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, those two minor characters out of the way, let's get to the meat, so to speak. GLaDOS has a couple of interesting mythological parallels that we can draw, but the most obvious one is Prometheus. Like, they don't even screw around, they just 
give you that one directly. The Oracle turret is a defective turret, or possibly Cave Johnson made metal if you believe the fan theory, that you meet with Wheatley early on in the game, but then again when you have the option to save it from the incinerator. Doing so unlocks the No Hard Feelings achievement, but even better, it cryptically tells you important plot details way before they are revealed to you in the story. Because the turret, among other things, would like to tell you about Prometheus. Prometheus is the creator of humanity and the trickster archetype in Greek myth. For example, when Zeus decides he wants mortals to sacrifice a portion of their livestock to the gods, Prometheus creates two piles, one of good meat hidden by offal, and another of sinew and bones covered by a thick layer of fat. And he says to Zeus, okay, you pick which one you want for the gods. Zeus, being Zeus, doesn't take it so well when he finds out he's been had and withholds the gift of fire from humans. Prometheus, being Prometheus, just goes, screw that, and steals fire back for the people. At first glance, GLaDOS seems like an odd choice for a Prometheus allegory, since Prometheus is the creator and benefactor of humans, and GLaDOS very much isn't. But it works on a metaphorical level. Prometheus bringing down fire from Olympus is the symbol of the quest for enlightenment, of breaking boundaries in the name of progress. For science, you monster. But, as is always the case, defying the gods comes with a very high price. For Prometheus, the price is being chained to a rock and getting his liver eaten daily by an eagle. For GLaDOS, it's getting imprisoned in a potato. And also getting pecked at by birds. Wheatley, the intelligence damping sphere, represents her foolish brother, Epimetheus, titan of hindsight. And Chell? Well, Chell is Pandora and Heracles rolled into one dangerous, mute, lunatic package. So most people are familiar with the image of Pandora, the woman who unleashes all evil into the world due to her insatiable curiosity, but what's not as well known is that from the gods' perspective, this was a feature, not a bug. See, after the business of Prometheus giving fire to mankind, which at that time was literally mankind, as in Y chromosomes all around, Zeus decides mortals need to be taken down a peg. So the gods fashioned the first human female, and gave her beauty and charm and grace and a bunch of other neat stuff, and so she was called All Gifted, Pandora. Zeus's contribution to Pandora's gifts were her curiosity and the box which she was never, 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 ever supposed to open under any circumstances ever. No, really, don't do it, wink, wink. And then she was presented to Epimetheus as a wife, and because Epimetheus is literally the embodiment of acting before thinking, he goes, sure, I'll take this beautiful creature fashioned by the gods that my brother only just recently pissed off. What could possibly go wrong? Moral of the story? Everything sucks not only because women exist, but because a man let himself be charmed by a woman in the first place. Greek mythology has special edition double size issues when it comes to relationships between the sexes. Pandora and Epimetheus, or Chell and Wheatley, are responsible for opening the box by bringing GLaDOS back to life. And she's certainly the source of all of the evils in Chell's world. Epimetheus is Prometheus's doofus relation, and honestly the analogy holds quite well. However amoral or murderous GLaDOS is, one thing she isn't is incompetent, whereas being incompetent is literally Wheatley's only function. He tries to turn on the lights and instead manages to wake a monster. Because of course he does. And then it just snowballs from there. Shell replaces GLaDOS with Wheatley, which unleashes more trouble and sends her on a journey through the underworld like every proper hero, and Wheatley gets all into the aperture systems and messes them up to the point where the entire facility is threatened with destruction. It's like a Matryoshka doll of Pandora's boxes. Speaking of heroes' journeys, I said Shell was like Pandora and Heracles? Like a lot of Greek heroes, Heracles is the son of Zeus and the mortal woman Zeus wanted to get into the pants of at the time, and because of that, he's an avowed nemesis of Greek mythology's favorite jealous wife, Hera. Heracles is... morally complicated. He performs mighty deeds of strength and heroism, but more often than not, he gets himself into trouble with his bad temper and occasional bouts of mental instability. The Twelve Labors, Heracles' most famous run of heroic daring do, were undertaken as an atonement for slaughtering his wife and children. A situation that Shell, who ends up tackling yet another series of test chambers by inadvertently reactivating GLaDOS, can probably relate to. We also layer on the Heracles-Prometheus symbolism by having Shell save GLaDOS. Okay, remember that thing about needing Atlas's help to get some golden apples? 
While on that quest, Heracles comes across Prometheus, kills the liver-eating bird, and in some versions unchains him as well. All this is done with Zeus's go-ahead, because parental bragging rights outrank revenge. And after Chell defeats Wheatley, and sends him to the moon, because Portal 2 also loves a good space moon astronaut motif, GLaDOS sends her to some singing turrets? and then into a wheat field? So basic overview on the afterlife according to the Greeks? You have to be on the extreme ends of the moral spectrum to merit any particular reward or punishment. Most souls wind up in Asphodel, which is kind of this endless meadow of lethargy and forgetfulness. It's pretty boring as afterlives go. The wicked are cast into Tartarus, which is the underworld of the underworld, and the punishments there tend to be of the extremely frustrating variety, which again Shell and GLaDOS can probably relate to. Pushing a rock up a hill only to have it roll back down again, trying to fill a bath with a sieve, or perhaps orbiting around the moon with an extremely talkative yet strangely single-minded companion. Of course, since Chell and GLaDOS have been there already... The virtuous heroes go to the fields of Elysium, Hades' idyllic gated community. But there's another wrinkle here in that Shell is also Heracles, one of the few heroes to enter Olympus after his time on Earth. And fittingly, her final journey is an ascent, with turret opera. The ending of Portal 2 has been hotly debated. Is Chell actually dead? Is this like a symbolic thing? Is she really just in a wheat field? And heck, why did GLaDOS let her go if she let her go at all? Thing is, the relationship between Chell and GLaDOS is complicated, but because of this it's also fascinating. GLaDOS in her potato stage and afterwards has at least two conflicting sets of feelings about Chell, Cave Johnson, the world, and everything else, frankly. First, there's the highly competent Sarki murder bot we've come to know and fight. Which is a very Hera and Heracles dynamic. Like Shell and GLaDOS, Heracles and Hera are inextricably linked through their animosity. In fact, the former's name is most commonly translated as Hera's glory. And then there's the kinder, more human side, which is obviously a remnant of Carolyn, who GLaDOS tries to delete at the end. There's also a popular fan theory that Shell is the daughter of Cave Johnson, or Carolyn, or both. Which would also fit in well with the Heracles myth, because Heracles is the son of a mortal woman named Alchemini and Zeus, who seduced her by disguising himself as her husband. Which, when you consider that other conquests involved him turning into a swan, a bull, a shower of gold, is actually on the lower end of Zeus's creepy meter. Man, Greek mythology is weird. But then again, so is Cave Johnson, so it's maybe not too much of a stretch to imagine him as Chell's daddy dearest, and the source of the stuff from Dad's work that made her science fair potato grow into a monster plant. It was already implied in Portal that Chell is the daughter of at least one Aperture Science employee. Remember, bring your daughter to work day is the perfect time to have her tested, so why not the daughter of the Finder and his secretary? And Cave Johnson does work quite well as a Zeus allegory. His remote, authoritative persona communicating his demands from on high, his capricious whims and unpredictable temper, and of course, the little matter of binding our Prometheus. Valvan mythology. Go hard or go home. But. After all that, I have to ask, who does the Space Corps represent? Maybe there are some things woman was just not meant to know. Maybe. Thank you, Diva. Oh, you're welcome. Now back to embarrassing dance numbers and criminal misuse of autotune. Well, rather you than me. See you next time.